Okay, folks. Uh, uh, we are we are coming to the to the end, um, and uh, in the interest of of getting us uh, adjourned uh, reasonably close to on time, uh, let's uh, let's see if we can reconvene. Um, our our final session on what has already been a a tremendous program. Uh, will uh, be some remarks uh, from Robert Chang. You can see from the slides up on the uh, on the screen and the and the and the monitors in back. He is professor of law and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Center for Law and Equality at Seattle University. Uh, professor Chang has written or edited three books and uh, some dozens of articles, at least on. Asian Americans and the Law, Critical Race Theory, uh, Immigration and Criminal Justice, among other topics. Um, and uh, just in, in keeping with the interdisciplinary uh, nature of the proceedings, uh, uh, Professor Chang has a, a degrees in microbiology and philosophy as well as his law degree. So with that, uh, welcome. Thank you. It's always hard to be the final speaker on an all-day program. I congratulate you all for uh, being here. So um, I'd like to thank Michael Silverstein uh, for inviting me to speak here, and also Professor Rukaja Yerby, who actually, I think, initially extended the invitation. Uh, and so um, my remarks are entitled, How's It Going to End? From Che Chan Ping to Korematsu to the Muslim Travel Ban Cases. So uh, for those of you uh, who like pop culture, uh, you might have gotten it from the title already. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite movies, The Truman Show, from 1998. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, this is a movie about a reality TV show called The Truman Show. It follows uh, a boy uh, from his birth uh, into adulthood. And uh, the thing about it is that he's the only one who's not in on it in, in terms of it being a reality TV show. There are actors in this enclosed uh, set uh, where he just lives his life. Uh, and this button is a button uh, that was worn by uh, viewers uh, just sort of wondering, how's it going to end? And in some ways, I thought it was appropriate uh, to, to have this as, as a title for this in terms of how's it going to end because uh, it's sort of like a reality TV show every morning. It's, it's, I, I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know what each day is going to bring. Uh, it's been in some ways very frustrating with regard to uh, the, the various travel bans. Uh, so there's the first one, January 27, and then March 6 does a new one. And then the Supreme Court ends up mooting and vacating the earlier opinions. And so then he comes out with, uh, you know, the presidential proclamation on September uh, 24th. Uh, the good thing about the September 24th one that Professor Marguli said, from a perspective of somebody who's, who wants to see closure or resolution is that this is one without an end. Uh, so uh, it's more likely that this is actually going to uh, be uh, reviewed uh, to some resolution by our Supreme Court. So this is a, a picture of SeaTac Airport. So I live in Seattle. Uh, and this mirrors in some ways uh, what occurred in airports around the country. Uh, you had uh, the executive order come out on at 5 p.m. Uh, on January 27th, uh, causing chaos around the country, airports all around the country. But you also had people mobilizing uh, in a way that was very different from what happened with regard to the Japanese incarceration, with regard to EO 9066, and also with regard to the various military exclusion orders. So something very different. But the other thing about this image was that when this was happening, I felt very powerless. Uh, in part because I saw this thing happening, I thought it was wrong, but I also didn't, I felt like I didn't have the tools to do anything about this. I'm not an immigration lawyer, I've never filed a habeas corpus petition, I wouldn't know where to start. Uh, and so I was just sort of at a loss. At a loss, but also in some ways feeling hopeful. Uh, but as the course of the litigation uh, started to proceed, I started to see some ways where, oh, 
I have something that I might be able to say. Uh, and so with regard to uh, the, the litigation, I mean, the other thing about it is that uh, things happen so quickly. So for those of you who were in law school last year, you saw cases start and you got resolution, you got appellate decisions. Uh, law was happening at the speed of light. I hope you know that that's not the way that most cases go. Uh, as an example, uh, this summer, uh, I just had a trial in Tucson on behalf of students who had challenged an Arizona law that was used to terminate the Mexican-American Studies program. I've been working on that case for five years. The case was actually uh, filed seven years ago. It takes a long time. It's very frustrating, uh, and that's just one of the realities uh, to doing this. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so one of the cases uh, that did go forward was Washington versus Trump. You had Judge Robart uh, in, in, in the eastern, I'm sorry, the Western District of Washington, uh, who was presiding over this case. And in this case, you had the government making certain arguments, uh, the plenary power doctrine that you've heard about. So Congress has plenary power over the admission and exclusion of aliens. Uh, because the exercise of the president's authority was committed to his discretion by law, judicial review is precluded. Now, I hope you understand that this notion of plenary power is a deformity. I think Professor Motomira has talked about that, and also his work on phantom constitutional norms uh, really tried to, to show uh, that maybe there were some inroads uh, being made here. But it's so different from the tradition that we learned, so in civics class and also in con law. So the celebratory uh, discourse about the democratic process, the way that the courts act as a check on the excesses of Congress and the executive, that's the grand narrative. But somehow there's this ex immigration exceptionalism where somehow matters with regard to the border are somehow outside of the purview of the judiciary. And the government attorneys were going to try to make as much of it as they could in terms of defending uh, the various Muslim travel ban orders. Uh, and so the other thing about that moment uh, in terms of, of what happened on January 27th was that I had a, I had a feeling of deja vu. <clears throat> and the feeling of deja vu is that when uh, the order went into effect, you had people on airplanes coming into this country. They had pieces of paper that said that they had the legal authority to come here. They came to customs uh, and they were sold, you can't come in. That piece of paper that gave them the legal authority is no longer valid. And so then I thought about, oh, this is, this is uh, we've seen this before. This is Che Chan Ping versus the United States. So Che Chan Ping, this is, and this is, uh, so Che Chan Ping is a laborer who came to the United States in 1875. In 1882, they passed the first Chinese exclusion law. One thing about it is that, you know, a lot of times, I also sometimes make this, this error. I sometimes overstate it as, as, you know, Chinese exclusion. Well, it was Chinese, it was exclusion of Chinese labor. So it was also a class-based immigration scheme. Uh, and so in some ways, calling it uh, Chinese exclusion uh, sort of writ large, uh, that didn't happen until uh, 1924, and I'll get to that. And so uh, 1882 was, was the, the first Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, and then uh, in recognition that sometimes Chinese laborers here in the United States might want to go back to visit their families in China, they created the system where if you got a certificate of reentry before you went back to visit China, that you could present this upon your return and this was your ticket back in. So Che Chen Ping in 1887 got one of these certificates. And it's fascinating, and you can't see the detail here, but you see here that he's five feet, three inches and five eighths. So he's got five eighths of an inch on me. Uh, you find, <laughs> it's not easy to have much on me, uh, but um, you also find uh, that he had a mole on his upper left lip and, and, and maybe on the right corner of, it, of his lip. They talk about his complexion being brown. They talk about his eyes, the colors being brown. Uh, but this was his ticket back in. So he went to visit China in 1887. So, uh, transportation technology being what it is, uh, on September 20, I'm sorry, September 7, 1888, he boards a steamship to come back to San Francisco. Then the 1880, so then uh, in 1888, they made an amendment to uh, the various exclusion acts, and this said that these previously recognized, legally authorized certificates of reentry, they're no longer good. And so he arrives on October 8 one week after the law becomes effective. And so then he presents this certificate and he is not permitted entry. He is held on board the steamboat. And so then he uh, 
pursues a petition, a habeas corpus petition. Uh, it's denied, and then he appeals it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so then the U.S. Supreme Court has to decide, is it okay for Congress to do something like this, to make this change with regard to the law that affects this person's rights? And in some ways, this is where we get the notion of, of, of the plenary power doctrine. Uh, we see uh, various applications of the plenary power doctrine. It was used to justify uh, the, the termination of, of the rights of, of these uh, reentry certificates. Uh, and we also have, uh, there was a reference uh, description earlier uh, in Professor Aziz's presentation. Sorry, it's, it's uh, in Professor Aziz's uh, presentation about um, earlier registration programs. And so Fong Yu Ting was a challenge to uh, the registration program. And part of the registration program is the Chinese labor, in order to be able to, to get that certificate of residence, had to have one credible white witness testify. Uh, and it was rooted in this idea or notion that uh, the Chinese are, are mendacious, uh, you can't trust them. And it actually also goes back to the Che Chan Ping case. So in Fong Yu Ting, they actually quote uh, some of the language from Che Chan Ping. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, whoa, that's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I want to I wanna highlight some of the language from I want to highlight some of the language from Che Chanping. And so the court in that opinion talks about the oriental invasion. They talk about the great danger. They talk about the West that could be overrun by the Chinese. Dangerous to its peace and security. Uh, it matters not in what form the aggression and encroachment come, whether from a foreign nation acting in its national character or from vast hordes of its people crowding in upon us. Xi Jinping and the plenary power doctrine I see as being located in, in national anxiety and also national security concerns. There, is, uh, uh, there are references uh, to the idea or notions of sovereignty, uh, political philosophy with this idea that a nation that does not control its borders is effectively dead. Uh, because it's not a nation. You need to control your borders. And so it emerges in some ways from this, and we also get the notion in some ways of, of this idea that uh, decisions about this are political, and in some ways uh, that's what, why the judiciary should not, um, not uh, say anything. And so, you know, so, so the statement in particular, uh, it's the political branch's uh, power to exclude aliens is largely immune from judicial control. So in some ways, that's, that's really what we're talking about with the plenary power doctrine. Now, the thing about Chinese exclusion is that it worked with regard to stopping uh, Chinese labor immigration, and it actually was tremendously successful in encouraging what we now call from a, a candidate Mitt Romney, self-deportation. Uh, the population of Chinese immigrants in the United States States went from about 120,000 down to 60,000 in a 30-year period following Chinese exclusion. But the problem is they won't stop coming, but the thing is that the they is different. So after the Chinese, it became the Japanese. And so then what was the resolution to that? The resolution was the 1907-08 Gentlemen's Agreement, whereby Teddy Roosevelt entered into an agreement with the Japanese government where the Japanese government would stop issuing visas to laborers if the president intervened with regard to the segregation of Japanese children in the San Francisco schools. And so that was the bargain that was entered into. And you might wonder, how was it that J Japan was able to get that resolution? Well, they had just beaten Russia in a war. Uh, so they were uh, in some ways thought to be uh, in a position of greater power. Uh, in terms of the they won't stop coming, so after the, the uh, Japanese, after the 1907-08 uh, Gentlemen's Agreement, uh, then you start to have immigration from South Asia, so uh, people from uh, what we now think about as India and Pakistan. Uh, but as uh, the, the, the thing about discrimination is that discriminators become more sophisticated. Uh, and so previously, they just referred to them by name, Chinese exclusion. People from China are not permitted in. But the way then that they stop the South Asians from coming in is through a geographical designation that marked out latitudes and longitudes. So Asia demarcated by certain latitudes and longitudes, and this is what you get. Now, although my understanding of it is that it was primarily directed to stop South Asians from coming, you see that it also was a previous Muslim ban. 
uh, by territory. You see that it was an Arabic Christian uh, ban also, if you think about the territories that are covered here. So this was in 1917. Then in 1921, there was this sort of intermediate uh, National, Orange, uh, National Origins uh, Quota Act. Uh, and in the 1921 version of it, the country decided that, well, we want America to have a certain character, certain racial ethnic character. And so what they did is that based on the U.S. Census from 1910, they would permit a certain percentage or in, you know, in terms of the, the cap every year, a certain percentage uh, of the number of persons from that country of origin residing then in the United States would then be permitted to come in. So that was the way the quota was set up. In 1924, they decided, well, 1910, well, by that time, we already had too many undesirable people here. So so that was not the right picture of the America that they wanted. And so then they extended the time back to the census of 1890. And it was 2% of the people uh, from 1890. Now, one of the funny things about it is that uh, even though there was Chinese exclusion in place, China had a quota still, and under the quota it was 105. And I've always wondered, well, why would you give a quota to a country that, that you don't allow people to, you know, to enter in? Uh, and it was just this formality. They just said every country, and then they did either a minimum of 50 or uh, the 2% of the population in 1890. Now, I also learned years later that there were actually uh, people who were able to come in under the Chinese quota. Uh, and these were Jews who, uh, prior to World War II or World War II, were able to make it to China. They were actually able to come in under the Chinese quota at a time when the Chinese were not allowed to come in, one of the ironies that existed there. Now, the other thing about the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 is that this is what consolidated Asian exclusion. So then, rather than referring to Asians by name, uh, they referred to aliens ineligible for citizenship. Aliens ineligible for citizenship. At that point in time, uh, the, the naturalization law said that free white persons and persons of African nativity or descent could become naturalized mm -hmm. citizens. And so uh, aliens ineligible for citizenship, uh, that covered uh, persons from Asia. So uh, these words uh, did tremendous harm. Uh, you had a number of states that had uh, various alien land laws and restrictions with regard to professions, and also with regard to our professions. There were many uh, bar associations around the country that did not permit aliens ineligible for citizenship uh, from becoming attorneys. You also had the constitutionalization of uh, Asians are not being eligible for citizenship. You had Azawa versus the United States in 1922, a person who was in Hawaii who tried to become naturalized. Now, one of the funny arguments that he made to the court was he came to court and said, I'm white. Uh, because he knew, sort of legislatively, statutorily, that he either had to be white or he had to be of African nativity or descent. And he didn't want to claim, and, and you know, there's, there are issues that, that exist with regard to uh, racial distancing that sometimes exists. But uh, he came in and said he was white. And he presented his skin as, as part of the testimony. He was apparently fair-skinned. He also had a cultural anthropologist uh, a report who years ago who had traveled to Japan and in the report talked about the white people live of Japan. And so he presented this as the evidence to the court. So in 1922, the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, we're not really sure what to do with your white argument, but we're going to understand the free white persons as referring to people of Caucasian ancestry, and you're not Caucasian, so therefore you don't get in. Now, at the same time, though, there was another case coming through the courts, and this is United States versus Thind. So a man from, from South Asia. And the thing about it is that ethnographic knowledge at the time considered people from South Asia to be Caucasians, in part based on this idea of the Aryan Mountains and the way the language operated, so that based on, on, on language, uh, you could tell that, that they shared a common ancestry. So he comes to court and says, <laughs> Last year, you said Caucas white equals Caucasian. He comes in and says, I'm Caucasian. He's trying to do the, the, like, you know, the, the formal logic that, that should result in, in, in a different outcome in this case. Uh, the court there said, well, we know that uh, we said Caucasian a year ago, but, and 
we're going to actually move away from scientific notions or understandings of, of race, and we're going to go with what the common person on the street would consider a free white person. And you, who are brown, is, you are not a free white person. And therefore, he was then excluded uh, from becoming naturalized. One of the consequences of that decision was actually very tragic. There had been maybe dozens of, of South Asians who had been able to naturalize, uh, and they were denaturalized. Uh, and you actually had a couple committing suicide because of this. Then, with regard to the Filipinos, uh, the problem with Filipinos is that they're Filipino, they're, they're American nationals because uh, the Philippines was a colony. And so then the way to formally stop Filipino immigration was the Tidings McDuffie Act of 1934. Uh, and what that did is that we're going to give you independence in 10 years. Uh, you're not independent now, but because we're going to give you independence in 10 years, you're no longer U.S. nationals. Uh, and therefore then subject to the 1924 immigration exclusion. Um, we see that there's a changing tide, uh, the Magnuson Act of 1943. All of a sudden, persons of Chinese ancestry can become naturalized citizens. Now, you might think, oh, we're seeing progress there. Uh, this actually is a great example of the interest convergence hypothesis uh, that Professor Derek Bell put forward in the context of critical race theory. The changes that occur sometimes occur uh, you know, that advantage a minority don't occur because a society has actually changed its views, but because it's in the interest of society to give you these rights. And so during World War II, China was an ally of the United States uh, against Japan. Japan was going to China and tell, ask, telling the Chinese, why would you join with the United States when they don't even let you into the country or allow you to become citizens? So sort of cynically, uh, the 1943 act uh, occurred. Evidence that this is uh, uh, interest conversion, uh, convergence is that there was an effort also to allow Koreans to become naturalized at that time. Korea, though, was a colony of Japan. Uh, there was no inch, you know, advantage to the United States, and therefore the Koreans uh, were not included in that. Then you're at in 1946, following World War II, all of a sudden South Asians and Filipinos can become naturalized citizens. It was the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, uh, that removed the racial bar to naturalization. It also included what we saw earlier, 1182F. Uh, the Hart-Seller Act of 1965, that was discussed by Professor Margulies, uh, the Immigration and, and Nationality Act of, of 1965. Uh, this got rid of the national origins quota, and I don't need to say more because we just heard about this, but this is what included 1152A. So what you see is that part of the context for these changes, uh, it occurs uh, based on what existed before. Um, and so then, uh, just a little more in terms of detail with regard to the Immigration and Nationality Act. You see the 1952, 1182F, uh, giving tremendous discretion to the president. Um, and I don't know if any of you were wondering, why did he do the third one as a proclamation and not as an executive order? When I saw the proclamation, I then got onto the, the Google, right? It's like, you know, what is the difference between a proclamation versus, versus an executive order? And is there room now to make an argument, oh, this is just a proclamation, and so it's not as powerful as an executive order? Um, it turns out that there really is no effective difference in terms of the legal effect. But it's because of 1182F. He may by proclamation, and for such period, he finally like read the statute, or the Department of Justice read the statute, and it's like, oh, we need to do this by proclamation to come squarely, right? Because that's the statutory argument they're, that they're making, to fall squarely within and to you know, strengthen their argument based on 1182F. Compared to 1152A, different moment, uh, the civil rights era, and just this moment when the National Origins uh, Quota Act is eliminated. Very, very different moments. Now, um, I'm going to shift now to, to think a little bit about how the, the immigration history and plenary power then also fits into the context then of, of national security and, and Korematsu. Um, and I'm not sure I'm doing the transition very well, but it'll be an abrupt one, but let's just switch for now. Um, and part of the switching, though, is also connected with um, what uh, the Korematsu Center has been trying to do in, in the context of these Muslim travel ban cases. And so then the first case that was really getting traction was the one in New York, Darwish. Uh, and in Darwish versus Trump, 
you had a habeas corpus petition where within 24 hours you had a TRO put into place. And then the court said, oh, we're going to have expedited briefing on the preliminary injunction. Um, I knew that we wanted to, to start uh, participating as amicus because we thought we had contributions to make. Uh, I called my former research assistant uh, from Loyola from the 1990s who had taken my Asian Americans in law class and helped uh, do research for my first book. Um, and, I, and who is a corporate law partner at Aiken Gump, I knew that we were going to have to need, you know, we were going to need a lot of resources, especially because cases were being filed all around the country. And our view toward amicus work is not to wait until it gets to the high court, uh, intervene early, because it's at the lower courts actually where you can make more of an impact. Uh, and the idea is to get the good impact early and the def then defend it instead of trying to uh, go against, uh, overturn uh, a bad outcome. Uh, that, that came about. And so I called her up and said, hey, you know, so do you remember all that research you did on the plenary power doctrine and, and immigration exclusion? And she just, there's a long pause. Uh, I said, well, never mind, it doesn't matter. Because um, uh, we had just worked together on another amicus brief in the New York Court of Appeals where uh, we were arguing that color should be cognizable for purposes of a Batson challenge. Uh, in the exercise of peremptory challenges. And so we ha had had a good experience working together. I asked her, I, I told her what we needed. I said that uh, there are two doctrinal interventions that uh, I thought were available to us. The first one was with regard to the plenary power doctrine. I saw this as an opportunity to get uh, the courts uh, to engage in more meaningful judicial review, even with regard to matters regarding immigration. And I thought that was going to be a big win if we could do that. And then the other thing was with regard to Korematsu, with regard to national security. I thought that it was a way then to remind the court of what had occurred. Uh, and so it's really the confluence of those two that came together. And then, unfortunately, you know, what happened was that Washington versus Trump started happening really quickly. And so on Friday night, uh, one week after the, the, uh, the executive order, the ninth, it, it gets appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit uh, says, well, amicus briefs are due on, on Sunday evening. And so um, I think we found out on Saturday they would, that they were due on Sunday. So on Sunday morning, I called her up and said, you know that brief we we're going to file in 10 days in, in the Eastern District of New York? Uh, could we file tonight in the Ninth Circuit? <laughs> There's a p long pause, and she said, uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, but sh she conferred with her team, and then it turned out that because uh, there were some young associates who were just really excited about doing this work, actually, even on Saturday, before I made this ask, they'd actually drafted a bunch of stuff. So she calls me back and says, we can do it. And then we learn that there's routine maintenance uh, with regard to the electronic filing system. So you can't file between 10 p.m. and midnight on Sunday. But the government, the court said that the briefs were due by midnight of that night. So then I asked, can you file by 10 p.m.? And <laughs> she said yes. Uh, and they did. Uh, and that was the first uh, amicus brief that we did. Um, and it's been a remarkable experience uh, filing these briefs around the country. And sort of a lesson for law students here is you need to learn the local rules, and you also need to learn local chamber rules. And so, for example, in a case in California where we file, uh, we learn that the judge rejects filings if they're not too hole punched on the top and, you know, like a certain distance between the holes. Uh, with regard to the Arab American Civil Rights League versus uh, Trump in, in, in Michigan, I forget whether it's Eastern District or Western District, um, but we learned that the judge requires fiscal copies, you know, courtesy copies to be delivered to his chambers on the day of filing. Uh, you learn all of these things, and the thing about it is you don't want to lose a case because the judge dings you on something like this. You want to be able to get to the substance, but it's really important to understand the, 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 the way that le you know, local rules operate and chamber rules operate. And so um, as we're doing this briefing, we also uh, start to get excited because all of a sudden some of our arguments seem to be making some traction with the judges. So in the Fourth Circuit, we had Judge Wynn, uh, 
musing, and this is an excerpt uh, that, that Professor Aziz had, had put up before, but Judge Wynn sort of musing, well, what about Korematsu? And the thing that frustrated me about this during the oral argument was that he didn't ask a question, and so the government attorney didn't have to answer anything about it. He just sort of mused, what, what about Korematsu? But then you get Judge Paez, uh, who, who asks about uh, Korematsu, and you get Solicitor General Wall saying, this case is not Korematsu, and I wouldn't be standing here, and the United States wouldn't be defending it if it were. You're not anywhere near Korematsu. Now, that statement really bothered me because I had seen the government's earlier briefing where the government relied on this case from 1952, Heresiades versus Shaughnessy. Cold War, a uh, Greek national who had lived many years in the United States, uh, and the question was whether he could be deported. I think I have the facts right. There are so many of the cases, and, and I, there are other, my colleagues can, can correct me if, if I'm wrong about this. Um, but Heresiades cites to Korematsu and Hirabayashi. And so then, if the government is relying upon statements in Heresiades that relies on Hirabayashi and Korematsu, they are in the name, they're not just near, they're relying upon Korematsu. And so it bothers me when they say this, but they hide it by doing that. They don't refer directly to Korematsu because it is the case that you can't uh, rely on. Uh, they also uh, rely to a very heavy extent on the plenary power doctrine cases. And so that's the root of those cases. So whether it's Heresiades or Metsai, a case from 1953, uh, it is in the neighborhood of Korematsu. And so then, uh, in terms of thinking about Executive Order 9066, we have this idea of a blank check. Uh, we have, uh, we've already had a discussion about General uh, DeWitt and his uh, military exclusion orders. Um, this is a picture of Bainbridge Island. Uh, executive, so the first military order requiring uh, exclusion, the evacuation, uh, order number one was uh, covering uh, Bainbridge Island in, in the Seattle area. A picture of Manzanar, uh, which I always find super ironic, the flag that's centered here. And then this one is of a child uh, who, I, and I'm not sure whether this is to report to the assembly center or from the assembly center to go to uh, the incarceration camps. But uh, this came up yesterday because uh, Walmart got in trouble for this. They're selling posters of this, and this is the way that they're advertising this. The perfect wall art for any home, bedroom, playroom, classroom, dorm room, or office workspace. I can't imagine anything more tone deaf than that. I mean, I can see, you know, there, there are very good reasons, I think, to have uh, representations of the past. And I can see why people might want to have representations to remember. Uh, but this is just completely acontextual. It's commodifying uh, the... the, the uh, the pain, suffering, the harm uh, to this family and to this community uh, and to this group. Uh, and, you know, Walmart, uh, to give them credit, they did respond quickly and apologize for it, and I think they've stopped selling it. Um, so, uh, how long are we going? I know we started a little bit late, so. Okay, so I'm going to try to wrap up in, in my remarks in, in about uh, seven minutes or so. So um, <clears throat> you've heard a lot about uh, Gordon Hirabayashi uh, and Fred Korematsu, uh, and those cases, I think, tend to get more attention because uh, there's more in those opinions. But one of the early people who protested was uh, Min Yasui. Uh, and Minoru Yasui was a graduate of the Univers University of Oregon Law School. Uh, and as soon as the curfew order came down, he said he was going to protest this. And he was walking up and down the streets on Friday evening after the curfew to try to get arrested. Police officers said, go home, you're going to get into trouble. And so then he reports to the local police station and says, arrest me, I'm violating the order. And so they oblige him. But the thing about it is he had forgotten that if you get arrested on Friday night, you don't get arraigned until Monday morning. So he ended up in the drunk tank, the local drunk tank, all weekend and he, he talks about how he regrets uh, that experience. Uh, but these are pictures of them as young men. Uh, and so uh, I think it's, it's useful also to, to remember uh, that there are people attached 
uh, to these case names. Uh, in terms of the themes that you see developed, uh, there's this idea of deference in Hirabayashi. It is not for any court to sit in review of the wisdom of their actions or substitute its judgment for theirs. You get deference in Korematsu, uh, where although there's this facial recognition uh, that, uh, that, that classifications uh, singling out a single racial group are immediately suspect, uh, you find that they don't do anything about this. Now, one thing that I've always found very interesting about both of those cases, so in Hirabayashi, it's written by Chief Justice Stone, uh, and Chief Justice Stone um, has this sort of throwaway line where he reminds people that the Fifth Amendment, which governs the federal government, does not have an equal protection clause. I've always sort of wondered about that. It's like, what, what's the point about a phrase like that? As though if it had something like that, would you have had a different result? And for those of you who aren't familiar with, with uh, the Equal Protection Clause and the federal government, uh, it wasn't until Bowling versus, versus Sharp, one of the cases uh, that, that accompanied uh, Brown versus Board of Education, but Bowling versus Sharp was DC schools, which is the federal government. Uh, they had to find that the Equal Protection Clause was part of the Due Process Clause in the, the Fifth Amendment. Uh, but uh, Chief Justice Stone says there is no uh, equal protection clause uh, binding the federal government in the Fifth Amendment. The other thing about Chief Justice Stone is that he's the author of footnote four in Caroline Products. And so there's this sort of delicious irony here where the person who talks about this searching scrutiny for insular minority groups somehow is not able to, to see this. Um, so, uh, and then we have the dissents. Uh, we've, we've already uh, talked some about this, so I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, I love it uh, that there's a portrait of uh, Chief, I'm sorry, Justice Jackson here, uh, because uh, his phrasing in terms of the loaded weapon, I think, is a very powerful um, Insight. Now, uh, we've heard a little bit about the Quorum Novus cases in the 1980s. And so what happened is that there was newly discovered evidence. There was an archivist, Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga, and also Peter Irons, a historian. They found materials in the archives. And this is a reference to the originals of the DeWitt report that uh, included uh, more problematic phrasings and, and manufactured assertions uh, having all been destroyed. Um, we also learned that there's newly uh, discovered evidence that there were suppressed intelligence reports, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the FBI, and the FCC. Now this one is a memo from uh, Edward Ennis, who was in the Department of Justice, and this is to Solicitor General Fahey. And it's really the top paragraph. I'm going to read it because it's probably hard to read. Uh, in view of this fact, I think we should consider very carefully whether we do not have a duty to advise the court of the existence of the Ringel Memorandum and of the fact that this represents the view of the Office of Naval Intelligence, it occurs to me that any other course of conduct might approximate a suppression of evidence. And so you have what might be a CYA memo from Edward Ennis to his boss saying, are we going to perpetrate a fraud upon the US Supreme Court? Because if we don't do this, uh, present it correctly in this brief, then that's what we're going to end up doing. And there's this fascinating account, uh, I think it's footnote two um, in, in the, the, the government's brief, but the sort of the massaging of the language in, in footnote two, where in some ways the original version had a more explicit acknowledgement that the evidence may not really have been there, but then all of a sudden it's turned into gobbledygook where you don't really understand it. Uh, and it's intended to, to obscure uh, rather than explain anything. Uh, we had a discussion earlier about uh, Judge Marilyn Hall Patel uh, and some of the language that she offered uh, when she uh, overturned Fred's wartime conviction. Now, shifting really quickly to Muslim uh, travel ban number three. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Judge uh, Theodore Chuang uh, in the District of Maryland. And so we asked the D DOJ attorney, Hashim Mupan, how is this different from Korematsu, and expressed concern that it might someday be revealed that Trump's executive action wasn't consistent with with the DHS report, and then he asked a question, and this is a very calculated question. Are you representing to me now as an officer of the court, there's nothing in there that is inconsistent with this proclamation? Very powerful question. Uh, Mupan uh, pretty much dodges it uh, because he doesn't want to go on the record as, as affirmatively claiming that there is anything inconsistent. Uh, and so then we sort of end up with, well, so how's it going to end? Uh, today, uh, 
I keep looking at my email uh, in case we file, but uh, we're filing in the Fourth Circuit. This is a draft of the brief that we're filing in the Fourth Circuit. So in IRAP versus Trump, uh, we're filing it today. Um, and where we make these points. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention about uh, our filings uh, is that initially we, we filed just as the Korematsu Center because we had to act really quickly. We were soon joined by the children of Min Yasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu. And so this brief is on behalf of Karen Korematsu, Jay Hirabayashi, and Hala Yasui. And then the other thing is uh, that we also got uh, a very broad multiracial a coalition of the various national bar associations and also national civil rights organizations. Because part of the idea was, and this comes from a, a recent biography written by my colleague, uh, Lorraine Bonai, she talks about how uh, during World War II, Fred's in the courtroom in San Francisco, and his lawyer is with him, but he's pretty much alone. Very different from what occurred in 1984 when Judge Marilyn Hall Patel ruled from the bench when the courtroom was packed, but also very different from having all of these organizations join with the children here, so symbolically saying that there is uh, something here. Uh, and the power, I think, of our amicus brief is uh, that we think we're making a, a, you know, so amicus briefs fall into different categories. I describe this as a conscience of the court amicus brief, uh, and it's intended to get the court to think about and remember and to consider. Uh, and in terms of whether, uh, when we think about how it's going to end, uh, I think that uh, things are different uh, when we think about the pictures of all of the people going to the airports. And when I think about how in this past year, uh, the number of people taking the LSAT has increased, I think there's been a renewed sense of excitement uh, in terms of becoming a lawyer and what you can do, the contributions that you can make, the difference that you can make. And so don't think of this as a reality TV show where you are just watching. Uh, this is a reality TV show that we are all part of. And so in terms of how it's going to end, um, regardless of uh, what happens at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, things will only get better if things change with regard to politics. I want us all to be disabused of the notion that so social justice uh, depends solely upon litigation. I think litigation is one tool or pathway, but it's really in the political realm. And so in terms of changing hearts and minds. So I'm wearing a pin. You know, I don't have that button. I, I should order that from Amazon. I'm sure I could find it somewhere. But my pin says, stop repeating history. And that's part of the public uh, relations campaign, public education campaign that we've been doing in conjunction with filing of the briefs. Because we understand that for change to, to be durable, uh, it's going to have to happen because people change. Uh, and in terms of people changing, uh, it's going to depend on work that people do. And so uh, life is not a reality TV show. Uh, you are part of it. And so with that, uh, thank you. And I open up to questions. Thank you, Professor, for your for your speech. It was really fantastic. Um, I just had a quick question about how all these different iterations of the travel ban. I mean, it seems every time the Supreme Court gets close to hearing any kind of argument, it gets changed in some way and they have to send it back down. How do these changes affect the amicus briefs that you're filing in your analysis, if they do at all? So uh, fortunately, they don't <clears throat> change too much the content of the amicus briefs, because in terms of the specific interventions, it's about the plenary power doctrine, and it's about Korematsu. And that doesn't change. Now, the concern I have with the different iterations is that as we get further and further away from the campaign, uh, in terms of the probativeness, um, you know, the weight that we will be given on the earlier statements, I'm concerned in terms of how courts will regard the factual record. Uh, so that's a real concern. I'm really concerned also with the way that the US Supreme Court uh, did this during the summer. They did this very artfully. And so in some ways, by upholding part of the preliminary injunction, but knocking down the other part of it, which then allows the EO2 to be in effect. And then they were also very much, what they were doing is they were running out the clock intentionally. They were running out the clock intentionally because 
for Ju Chief Justice Roberts, he sees a way then to avoid this question because the concern about all this always is the legitimacy of the institution. Uh, because the power of the court is, well, or will depend on whether or not people abide by it, whether the other branches of government abide by it. And so then, you know, that's the real serious concern when you get things like uh, the Arpaio pardon and what that says in terms of the role of the executive with regard to the power of the courts to enforce law. Uh, but in terms of the, the very quick answer to your question, fortunately it doesn't change too much. I'm very excited. I hope your journal is still interested in publishing our amicus brief. You know, so they had agreed to publish our, our Supreme Court amicus brief in EO2. Uh, I'm, whether it's that one or the EO3, I mean, in terms of the, the message that, that we're trying to, to, to get across, that part doesn't change so much. So I hope that doesn't change the calculus. But if you end up wanting to, you know, uh, to publish one of the other amicus briefs, then that's also fine. So, but it's quite possible that we'll have, you know, our amicus brief in EO3 uh, by the time publication comes around. Thank you. Uh, how do you see that it suppose the, the court gets the case and it's not mooted out in some way, as you suggested, it's possible it could. Uh, how do you see the court resolve? Gosh, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it, it, it's going to turn on the most powerful justice on the court. It's, it's going to turn on Kennedy. In some ways, that's where the Kerry versus Dean uh, concurrence of Kennedy is, is super important. And so then when I see, um, you know, and, and we talked about it in our amicus brief, but when I see the, the other amicus briefs that really highlight the importance of it and that are in some ways trying to speak to uh, Justice Kennedy, I think that's what it comes down to. Um, and I hope that uh, he remains healthy enough to hear and decide on EO3. I'm also concerned about what happened with, with the Jennings versus Rodriguez case, where that's a chance for the, the court to either bust boltress uh, the plenary power doctrine or to knock it down a little bit. Before Kagan just recently recused herself, I was more confident in terms of the outcome, but I'm less confident now in terms of the outcome. And, and I don't know whether Professor Motomura might have something to, to add there. But, um, because that's the other way that the court could uh, dodge the plenary power issue in the EO3 case, where if they decide uh, and reinforce the plenary power doctrine in the context of another case, Jennings versus Rodriguez, then it allows them to just say, oh, we're just going along with what we just did. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm concerned about that. Okay, can we wrap up? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I, it's been a long day. Um, which is, um, be, before we wrap up, um, I want to, first of all, to thank all of our speakers today. So could we get one last collective um, And I also want to recognize two folks who have done, uh, actually three folks who have done an enormous amount of work uh, to make this happen. Uh, one person is not in the room. Uh, she's been running around for months making this work. That's Eileen Drabowski, um, who is the mother hen here, and we ought to thank her. Uh, James Bedell in the back is the editor-in-chief, uh, and the person who's been referred to several times already, but who, who has made all of this go, uh, Michael Silverstein, uh, I'm the law review advisor uh, on, in that role and behalf of the law school. I want to thank all of you folks for making this day possible, uh, and we are looking forward to the symposium issue uh, later in the year. So thanks to all, and uh, thanks for being here.